Welcome, everybody. We are so glad you found us. We do apologize for the last minute change in our virtual room. We want to do a sound check and see who can hear us. If you would raise your hand, if you can hear my voice. Awesome. I see some hands going up. Fantastic. We will get started in just a few minutes. I'm going to put everybody's hand down now. Welcome, and we'll be right back with you in a few minutes. Once again, we'll be starting in just a minute. We're trying to have a little bit of mood music going on, but it doesn't seem to be coming through as clearly as we'd like it to. We appreciate all of you coming today. We're glad you've been able to find us. We have just a few more minutes and we'll get started. You may or may not hear music until we actually begin the broadcast.
Expo. Welcome everybody. One last sound check. Raise your hand if you can hear me. See a lot of people coming in, waiting for their name. We're going to give it one more second before we start the recording and get going. Lots of hands going up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. We're glad that you found our change in the room. This is Ivana Manthor Anderson, ESL Title III at DPI. Again, we have a lot of people logging in right now, so we're going to give it one more second just before we start the uh, recording and start the broadcast officially. While you're waiting for it to start, you could go through and post on the bit.ly something that stayed with you from last week. All right, let's go ahead and start the recording. This is Ivana Manthor Anderson with ESL at DPI, and we are so thrilled that you are with us here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are going to, thanks, Acquiring Minds Want to Grow. This is our second session looking at multiple pathways for supporting encoding and acquisition. We are so excited to have Tim Sims and Alicia Doss. Here is our uh, presenters today, and we're looking forward to hearing a little bit about what happened in session number one and moving into session number two. I'm going to turn it over to them now. Alicia and Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. We're excited to be here with you. Um, first, I believe we have to go through the... Uh, Ivana, are you going to go through directions as far as sound and all that? Sure. Sure. So everyone should have a control panel. Many of you have been with us before on webinars, but especially if you're new. On your control panel, you have the opportunity to use your computer, computer audio or your phone. If you are having trouble with your computer audio, one way to fix it is often just to toggle over to phone call and then toggle back to computer audio. You can also just unplug your headset and replug it sometimes as well if you're having trouble with that audio. You see the hand icon. Many of you have used that already. That's circled in orange or squared in orange. The hand icon is a way for you to let us know that you want to say something, but you can also use the chat box. And for this webinar, we'll also be using a Padlet. So for the most part, we'd really like you to use the Padlet because the chat box is really small and hard for us to keep up with. The Padlet will give you an opportunity to be organized under specific topics and to share your thoughts where everyone can see them whereas the question box only allows us to see them. So if you go on to the next slide. This is a map of the state of North Carolina, and we know that you probably know where you are, but for our first poll question, we are gonna ask you which area you are in. And we're actually gonna use the words, I believe, Northeast, Southeast, Sand Hills, North Central. Take a second and look and see where you are located because when the next slide comes up and when we launch our first poll, we are gonna be asking you where you actually are in the state and the visual will not be there. So I'll give you one more second. And there we go. So our first question is going to be, where are you joining us from today? You should see a poll on your screen now. You have the opportunity to just click on the screen and let us know where you are. If by some chance the computer does not let you answer on the screen, feel free to type in the question box. We did include as an option other because we know we have a number of people from South Carolina who've been joining us as well. We'll give it a few more seconds for people to vote. We're almost up to 70%. And we wanna hear from all of you. Oh, we do have 1% in the other category. If you're other, feel free to type in the question box where you're actually joining us from so that we can recognize that you are here with us. Fantastic, we're up to 75%. We'll give it about 10 more seconds. We know some people were still logging in. And again, for those of you that are just joining us, thank you so much for being flexible and joining us at our new link. We're glad you found us. All right, teacher time, five more seconds. I'm gonna close that poll and show you the results. So we do have 1% other. Um, Kristen, are you able to tell me where this person from other is? Did they share in the chat box? I'm not seeing South Carolina. 
There we go. Thank you for joining us, South Carolina. And we can see we have relatively equal numbers from the Northeast and Southeast, Central Sand Hills, Piedmont Triad and Southwest. And we need to grab some more of our friends from the West and the Northwest to join us too. So feel free to let others know that we're here and we're gonna head on to our next poll question. So we want to know not only where you're joining us from, but what your position is. So that poll has been launched. Again, if you choose other, please type it in the chat box so we can know what other is. Content teacher, ESL teacher, lead teacher, administrator. We know we might have people from our universities. We might have pre-K, all sorts of things out there. Great. We've got lots of others coming in on this one. Almost up to 70%. up to 75%. We'll give it about 10 more seconds, probably teacher time again. And we've stalled out at 79%. So I'm going to go ahead and share this with you. Yay, we have 10% content teachers. Thank you guys for joining us. We love our ESL teachers, but we really want to make sure that our content teachers are learning more about working with our English learners. So thank you for joining us. Lead teachers, 8% administrators. Thank you guys for taking time out of your day to join us. So important that our administrators know what's going on. Kristen, anything with the 16% others? We have a lot. We have program coordinators for ESL, district testing coordinators, instructional coaches, bilingual teachers. So welcome, instructional fac facilitators. Welcome, everyone. Nice. All right. So we're going to hide that and go to our next poll question. We want to know a little bit more. What subject do you actually teach? Oops. Let's see if Ivana can hit the right button. and actually launch the right poll. There we go. We only have five options um, for our choices, so we couldn't put math, science, ESL, and DLI, and social studies and arts all separate. Um, each one is equal and adhered to our hearts, but we just simply didn't have enough spaces to do it, so we combined them. Again, if you put other, feel free to put it in the chat box. You guys are getting a little bit faster. We're up to 70% already. I'm going to give it about five more seconds because we want to get into the meat of this webinar today. And we're going to stop and share. So we have a nice mix. We knew a lot of you would be ESL or DLI, but we do have math, science, ELA, social studies, and a whole lot of others. So thank you guys so much. All right. Let's turn it back over to Dr. Timothy Sims from Hickory City Schools and Alicia Doss from Harnett County Schools. All right, good afternoon. Um, as as Ivana said, my name is Tim Sims. I'm Director of Federal Programs for Hickory City Schools. Last week, we went right into content and never really introduced ourselves, so we thought we might introduce ourselves this week. Um, I am, I'm responsible for multiple programs at the Hickory, in Hickory City Schools. Um, I have my um, P PhD from UNC Charlotte, and I also currently teach part-time um, in at Greensboro College. Alicia, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Alicia Doss, the ESL lead teacher for Harnett County Schools, serving all K-12 schools, and um, yep, that's me. Um, and you, we are going into our second session of multiple pathways supporting encoding and acquisition with a focus on encoding and the power of acquisition based learning strategies um, again for those of you if there are people who were not with us last week um, one of the things we kind of really wanted to, to help people focus on in this session is what can we do to help students so that their minds want to grow, so that we can help them become students who want to be involved um, in their learning. 
So um, for us, we want we set some ground rules. Our first rule is to care for yourself. So your adults, we need you to care for yourself. You know, put your oxygen mask on first. So, but also to care for yourself in this in this time. So if there are things you need, please help yourself. Um, we are asking you to use Padlet to help share your thoughts and questions. Um, that kind of helps us focus it a little better. We can break it out a little easier to see. And then if you have technical questions, there's something wrong with your technology or something like that, please use the question box for those kinds of questions. And our final ground rule is to be kind. Be kind to yourself in this time. Be kind to our, our, each other. And be kind to us, too, because we're people, too. Um, but we're really excited to be here. Um, as we did last week, we have a Padlet posted. Um, the first one you already started on, and many of you already have already put post to, is what stayed with me from last week is. Um, then the next com um, area is I need clarification on, or I have a question or a comment about. I have a resource for the web page. Many of you realize we posted a web page. It's at the bottom left hand side of your screen. Want to grow seven bit.ly want to grow seven. So that's access to our web page where you have our presentations um, and it is available for you to gain information. Um, so if you want us to post something there, please let us know. Um, if you have questions about multiple pathways as we discuss them, that's one topic. If you have a question about and I know I'm going to get in trouble for this. If you have a question about arousal as a neurological arousal and engagement, please post about that. If you have a question about encoding for acquisition, please post about that. And then Alicia is going to do a piece towards the end. And so this is a, one of the pieces that um, is about writing letters um, and emails during remote learning. So she's going to ask for you for suggestions for where students might be encouraged to write. Okay, and then I keep forgetting I'm driving this time. So our hidden agenda is that we want you to relax, release, and rejuvenate. We want to take care of you for a little bit of time, help you feel a little bit more refreshed, help you feel a little bit more supported. Um, we want to provide some time of peace and encouragement for you because we know I am so impressed with the job our teachers are doing this year, but it has been so stressful for them. So we want to care for you for a little bit and let you know that you're loved um, and provide any kind of therapy we can provide for you. We also have door prizes. They're virtual, socially distant door prizes, but they are door prizes. So we're trying to leave you some little things digitally on our website that might be helpful to you. Alicia, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, just that we're really happy to be here. We're going to explain to you at the end what the door prizes are for this week, and we're going to add to um, that for next week and the week that follows. All right, so today we're going to start with a grounding technique, and this is just kind of an opportunity to help focus and to really get us grounded in our time, in our space, um, and, and help kind of pair that mental focus. Uh, we've all been doing multiple varied things. And so we would like to provide you some time just to kind of focus and, and come into our, our time together. So I'm gonna ask you to sit comfortably and close your eyes and to take a couple of deep breaths. You're gonna breathe in through your nose, two, three, and out through your mouth for one, two, three. Let's do that again. Breathe in through your nose for one, two, three, and out through your mouth for one, two, three. Now, I'd like you to open your eyes and I'd like you to look around for five things you can see. You can look within your room, out the window, what's in front of you. Name out loud for yourself five things you can see. Now I want you to think, become aware of five things you can feel. It could be the feel of your shirt, the texture of the material on your chair. What does your hair feel like? What's in front of you that you can touch? Next, acknowledge three things that you might be able to hear. Um, 
actually, when, when you're listening quietly, you can actually hear sounds in your room, maybe the clock ticking, my four-year-old singing songs to Frozen 2 um, in the background. That might be something you're hearing. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, now identify two things you can smell. Maybe the smell of the, the lotion on your skin, the smell of the, the um, fabric softener on your shirt. And finally, notice one thing you can taste. Maybe you have some chocolate handy or some mints, you're, you're chewing gum. And then finally, let's take a deep breath in through our nose. One, two, three and out through your mouth. One, two, three. All right, thank you um, for taking some time to ground with us. We wanted to go back to what you expected. Um, these are the answers you gave us as you registered. So you wanted research, you wanted strategies, you wanted information and ideas, you want brain information, you want EL strategies, and you wanted support. So I hope we're getting that through to you. Um, I think we started, we had a good start last week and we'll continue going with that this week. Okay. Um, so out of the essentials last week, you posted some things that stayed with you. Um, and one of the things I've seen posted a couple of times was that was Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, stayed with people and the fact that our kids are really in, a, in many are in the place where they're taking care of their basic needs um, and we're worried about our kids and so that's important um, and then um, the importance of emotional safety before any anyone can any learning can occur and how crucial that is to what we're doing um, I love this post because it, I, I feel like Learning is about is not about getting the right answers. It's rather about the journey, the process of acquisition of a new component. So I hope um, people were comfortable with that. Um, and then we also <laughs> um, we're talking about um, people again. More posts about Maslow was put in place. So I just wanted to kind of share that we wanted to reframe and connect to what we did last week. You also posted some questions to the Padlet. Um, and so one of, the, one of the questions that came up more than once was how would we begin a year virtually with students that are newcomers? Um, and I kind of want to say to people, uh, you know, we need to be aware of what might happen as we end, begin this, this school year and have some plans in place. And I do believe that each district is being challenged um, to come up with answers for this, but I also, don't want to borrow problems we don't have to meet yet. We are going to cover a lot of ideas about things we can do in our current context, which will be similar. And then I imagine we will be providing support over the summer uh, additionally um, to, um, yeah, I'm sorry, we're going to pr provide additional support over the summer, but I do know that today and the next two sessions, we're going to be directly addressing some of this. Um, Somebody posted, I'm concerned about the social emotional health of the students when they come back. And that is absolutely true. Um, and I'm, I'm also concerned about the social emotional health of our teachers when they come back. This has been very stressful for people. Um, and so I do think um, I read and shared an article today with um, my staff about we're going to have to plan for trauma, right? We're going to have to, it's, it can't be an add-on. It's going to have to be part of what we do as we come back and we're planning. So we're going to have to think of ways to ground our kids, think of ways to keep people emotionally healthy. One suggestion I have for you would be to look up Conscious Discipline um, by Becky Bailey. She really gives people um, skills and strategies to really address their personal, their personal well-being, and then how they can teach those skills to students. And so I would recommend that. We got a lot of I want a copy of the chart. And there will be copies of the chart in throughout this presentation. And I believe we linked a copy of the chart as part one of your door prizes. Um, and then um, so there, that is there for you. 
And then the, the other big kind of tension that rolled through our, um, our Padlet was the tension and concern about the lesson we chose to do and the fact that we would have kids do something that we hadn't taught them how to do first, that we actually kind of put kids into a design process without teaching them the steps first. Um, and some people really struggled with that idea um, and understandably so. Um, but I will say that, um, and we're gonna kind of address that more fully in, in the next couple of slides. Um, so I will say that um, we actually purposefully did that. The interesting piece of that is, um, so how we designed that lesson was we actually took a lesson one of my teachers taught um, remotely and that we were really impressed with. And then Alicia and I tinkered with it a little to kind of make the points we wanted to make about ways that we could have helped get more acquisition type strategies in that could really help encode the learning. So, and one of the things we, we tw tweaked with that is we made the conscious decision of have ki having kids experience the process of designing something before we actually gave them the actual answers of what the design process looks like. And um, we did that purposely, um, knowing that it, it would give students a place to anchor their learning. So as they learned about the design process, they could find places to connect it in their, in their brain. Um, and then we have some quotes that we picked up from the book because part of what we're trying to get people to really think about is that um, how our brains work. And the truth of the matter is our brains are naturally pattern seekers. So this gave students an actual opportunity to kind of look for patterns and look for things on their own. Um, so, Be so on page 93, she says the brain is a natural pattern seeker. On page 93, she also says see seeing patterns and figuring things out activates the reward pathway. So, and that's a really important note to kind of make is that this isn't about the reward pathway isn't about external rewards like giving kids candy or, or cookies or money. It's about the reward pathway is when you figure something out and it feels good inside of you. So we're, that is a natural thing that happens when kids figure out real problems. And then there's the need to make sense and see patterns um, increases the reward and motivation. So we really designed it because by designing their own bridge, it created an interest. Um, often the, the, so she says, but often curricula and especially textbooks are not de de designed in that way. We have tried so hard to make learning easy um, that we have robbed it of reward and pleasure. And I see a spelling error. We'll fix that. All right. So another one of the essentials we gave you um, and where we're starting, we're anchoring our work on is on the brain compatible brain compatible classroom article um and we share this in one in our live sessions but this is something we spend a lot of um we're sharing with you and we're working with janet zadina's multiple pathways to the student brain book it's energizing and enhancing instruction I'm not gonna spend any time talking about Maslow's hierarchy, just to remind that we talked about it last week and the importance of it, and this is where we start. We talked about the effective filter and the importance of having a warm, respectful, respectful environment so that kids can learn language concepts and skills. And then finally, we wanna we want talk about, well, it's not actually the final one, but we wanna talk about, um, encoding and acquisition and the important thing for us to do here is that we wanted to redefine it or define it again for you so that you could see our definition because you will hear these terms in different contexts or in different research or in different fields and they're referring to something slightly different from what we're referring it to so as we talk about encoding we're talking about the experiences and actions that allow perceived information or skills to be converted into a construct that can be stored within the brain and recalled later from long-term memory, which we'll be, we're kind of referring to as acquisition. Acquisition is the act of developing skills, language, concepts, and knowledge that are held in long-term memory and are naturally re retrievable. 
So it becomes part of your DNA. Like you don't have to think about it to do it. It is part of who you are. Alicia, would you want to add anything? If I can learn how to unmute myself. Uh, no, I think you're doing a great job, Tim. Thank you. All right, so our purpose today is really to start talking about these multiple pathways, supporting encoding and acquisition, that we're gonna be creating experiences for students to encode for acquisition and access the multiple pathways. When we talk about math, multiple pathways, Janet, re, re, nah, Janet Zadina refers to multiple pathways in the brain. She refers to three areas of multiple pathways. There's the multiple pathways in the brain. And we, these are brain processes. And we're gonna, these are the ones we're going to be talking about mostly today. But she also talks about the need for multiple pathways of teaching, that um, we have to diversify our instruction to reach the diverse students we teach. So there have to be multiple pathways for how we teach. And then finally, there are multiple pathways of knowledge about learning. And those pa pathways include research and neuroscience and psychology and medicine and education. Like there is lots of different places where we know about how kids learn. And we have to bring the best we can to kids. We need to incorporate all of that learning together. All right, so as um, we made you a little chart to help you remember the, the, the multiple pathways that Janet, um, Dr. Zadina um, suggests, the she says that there are multiple pathways to a student's brain. What I want to kind of highlight, though, is that we're not talking, some of these sound a lot like when we talk about learning styles. Um, you can't see me do air quotes, right, as I present in a, in a webinar. Um, but these are different from learning styles. A lot of times when we talk about learning styles, we tell, we try to help find what a kid's learning style is and use that learning style to support their learning and to be an anchor. Um, but this is a different way of looking at this. This is about, there are many ways in which we encode information. There are many ways in which we start making sense out of what we're, we're approaching. And so um, we have to, present information through as many of these pathways as possible so that we can, because the more pathways we present information through, the more connections kids are made and the more naturally retrievable it is. Um, so we have to structure environments that have a, experiences that arouse students and really bring them into it. Um, so that provides sensory input and that we're increasing their engagement that they want to be here. Um, so by doing things in multiple ways, and it actually supports students learning because they're intrinsically motivated. Especially now, you know, one of the challenges I think many districts and many teachers have faced is that there are kids who are not engaging. And it's some oftentimes kids who could engage and are choosing not to. And so if we can create experiences that spark a desire for learning, that help kids want to do something, they become self-motivated and they'll choose to do it. So, um, and they'll choose to do it if I'm not there, if you're not there, if their parents not, are not there, because they're, they're leaning in. They want to be able to acquire, you know, they want to do it. And, and through that want, they're gonna acquire the new concepts, language and skills that we're trying to teach them. So this, and this is just a reminder of the slide we did um, on the Janice Zadina's model of academic memory. There is a link to this model and descriptor definitions in the website. So you can have that and you can take it away with you. Um, but it's also available on all of our presentations. So you can, you can look at it that way. So this is just a, a reminder that what, Last week, we talked about the need for multiple ways of inputting information, that when we're doing this, we're going to fire it till we wire it, and that it's bringing in the, the arousal and engagement that helps bring in information um, for students. And that's just a reminder slide. We're going to talk a little bit more about this. All right. So. We're going to go back to the lesson we did last week. And if you didn't, if you weren't able to, to hear it, 
Um, I'll give a brief kind of synopsis, and then we'll talk a little bit more about some of this, the different way, one specific piece of the lesson. So in that lesson, we had a teacher who asked her students to design bridges. So the students went out and they were to design the bridges and come back and present them. Um, and as they, and they had certain criteria they had to meet, it had to be a certain size. They were supposed to use recyclable materials. They were given descriptors of how they could connect the materials. Um, so she kind of gave them more of an open-ended assignment. And then the kids went out and designed the bridges. And then they came back to a Google Meet um, to present the, the bridges. And then after that, the teacher introduced the steps of the engineering design process. And she had the students go back and think through the steps they used to design their bridge and compare it to what the engineering design process said they should and to see how maybe what they did differed how um, th then the process. And then she gave the students the opportunity to create mnemonic devices to help the students um, to remember the steps of the engineering design process. So the students were the ones creating the mnemonic device, not the teacher. So, um, just to, so what we were trying to, well, Alicia and I tried to go through and say, out of the multiple pathways, the sensory motor, the emotion, the reward, the attention and memory, the language and math, frontal lobe and executive function and the social, which pathways were, were being hit? So we talked, about um, that by designing, by doing the, that, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought because I'm hearing things through the door. Um, so that the, the, the reward pathway was, um, would be since the students were creating their own um, mnemonic device, the sense of accomplishment through doing that would be a reward pathway um, and that um, that in creating and sharing those mnemonic devices, they would be working with others and it's kind of a social experience. Um, so they could be sharing out what they did. Um, that attention and memory would be addressed because they're using actual memory strategies such as mnemonics, but also because it's something they're doing it, it, and attending to um, that was there for them. We talked about sensory motor, you know, that they were um, looking at the design process, that they were using their, um, coming up with their words um, to, to design it and putting that down for them to see. So they're kind of coming up with their own mnemonic. So it, it actually kind of, and, the, and then also auditorily that they're going through it as they present it and hear it and practice it. Um, that, they um, were definitely through the language, doing the language and math pathway. So they were um, creating language around the concepts that they had talked about. And then they're coming up with associations of things that they know in their language to do it, um, that it would hit the emotion pathway because it would be more of a fun thing to do versus, because um, they were coming up with their own opportunities. And then finally, um, Whoa, went too far. The frontal lobe and executive function pathway would also be targeted because um, it's about metacognition and, and thinking about your thinking and thinking about all the strategies they would need in order to master the concepts. So that's kind of how we connected all of the different pathways through. Um, and I'll give you a little hint. We're gonna give you more information on the pathways next week. We're, we're creating a chart to help really kind of describe them more in detail for you. We just wanted to kind of make you kind of experience them and kind of think about those are the pathways she presents. All right, Alicia. <laughs> Yeah, and I think now would be a good time. Um, Kristen and Ivana, I know you've probably been looking in the question box and the chat box. Is there anything that we need to address at this point? There haven't been as many questions typed in as I thought there might be, and you may have touched on this one a little bit earlier, but one of them is a wonder about the teaching concepts, how they're impacted when student needs aren't being met or the learning environment is not respectful or even scary. Mm -hmm. um, what science teaches us is that there is that fight or flight 
uh, reaction, students can become behavior problems when they put up their defense mechanisms or they shut down. So typically, um, even if we look at the affective filter in an environment like that, the student's um, imaginary filter in their brain would be like a thousand ply and not much of the academics would be going in to make rich coffee or, you know, to go into long term memory. Tim, did you want to add to that? Additionally, we know, and Janet Zadina talks about it in her book, that um, we know that when kids are scared, that there are chemicals that are put out in their in their nervous system that actually keeps the dendrites from connecting. They actually keep the information from processing in their brain, so they actually become physically unable to learn. Yes. Yeah. And we actually had a comment on the opposite side of that. Uh, talking about they work in a virtual school and so the students really will be emotionally and physically prepared for the next school year um, because that's sort of the environment that they're already working in so a real difference in uh, the impact that it might have based on the emotions of the students yes and we are we're working hard Tim and I in our virtual circumstances as well it's been really hard um, to do the webinar, much less our regular job, and I know that you guys are all feeling that. So we want to kind of work collectively on, on preparing for the next session. So anything that you put in a comment box or, or the question box or on the Padlet, we're actually going to gear next week's session, you know, to. So feel like you have a voice, even though we might not be hearing you today, we're hearing you. So we don't want you to forget that. And Tim, before I share out on this slide, would you go back to the slide before it? Sure. And I do see a question about, are we able to go back and look at last week's session? I believe it's recorded in, on our website. It is, right. and the PowerPoint is there. Um, and I think the recordings are actually on the DPI website, um, but we can have it posted on our website as well. Right. I'll link to those. And yeah. a lot of people are typing in the comment box. We really want to encourage you to type it in the Padlet so that everybody can see it. It also makes it easier for us um, to keep up because it's a small box and it scrolls a lot. So if the questions are coming in now. Do you want to take a few more or do you want to wait? Yeah, I think we have just a few minutes. We might not have any time at the end, but now's a good time because it can kind of guide our next slides as well. So then we have another comment that's kind of in between the two that I shared a minute ago. And it's entitled Regarding Virtual Schools, and they're actually still typing. But the concept is that they, although they teach virtual, some virtual classes online, that it really has impacted the students uh, because they're not used to doing all their work online. I'm trying to read as they're typing. They're impacted by having to now work more hours, babysit younger siblings, or take care of yes. other family members. So yes. even though they're comfortable with the online, there's all those other pieces that are playing into the puzzle. And I'm really glad you actually shared that because it goes into our next um, our, our next segue or segment. And I don't know how to explain this, but for me, in all of my experiences with the students that I have worked with, I've worked with those most challenging students. So everything that Tim and I are sharing with you is from our personal experiences. And if we and the content teachers that are with us today, especially if if and, and educators that might not be from the field of ESL, if we can learn to and we're coining this phrase encode for acquisition, even those situations are going to kind of take care of themselves, because if you have a student who doesn't have the technology, they're babysitting, they're taking care of their parents or whatever. If there's that intrinsic drive, they're going to find a way. And so. Today, it, in our session, it's about sparking that interest, interest. It's about the arousal. It's about the engagement. So take a picture of this slide in your head somehow. Someone asked about the six steps to encoding for acquisition. Those are the descriptors around the box labeled encoding. And Janet Zadina in her book says those are the six steps. A child needs to rehearse and repeat skills. They need to practice, okay? So that rehearsal and repetition box is important. Mnemonic devices that either you help them learn to create or they learn to create themselves. Chunking information, doing things in small, you know, bits at a time. Helping them make associations and make connections. 
This is big with Pransky, and he would actually probably call this recoding, and that's reformatting um, little box. And that is taking what the teacher has presented or the students have learned and turning it into language, turning it into a design, turning it into something other than, you know, just what the standard wanted me to know. And then finally, we hit the multiple pathways. And if we are addressing those multiple pathways in the lessons that we prepare, whether we're in the classroom or virtually, then we are encoding for acquisition. We have not touched the acquisition box yet. I talked to Ken Pransky this week, and he actually says that attention, if you look at the box to the left of the big acquisition box, he believes that attention should be all the way from the beginning of this flowchart to the end, and he would not actually keep it in the acquisition section. But anyway, what well, Tim and I are going to start to do. I'm yeah. going to pause you for a minute. I'm hearing you loud and clear, but we have several people who have said either they can't hear or the sound is coming in and out. So I'm just going to encourage people who are listening, if you have multiple windows open, please go ahead and close those windows. Um, I'll encourage our presenters to do the same, but I'm hearing you guys loud and clear. We've only had four out of 275 people say they can't hear you, but I just wanted to address that real quickly. I really do apologize, and I'll try to talk a little slower, too. I'm a little nervous, though. <laughs> I'll try to talk slower and louder and clearer. Um, so I want you to hold this, these images in your head, the descriptors around encoding especially, and the multiple pathways. We're not going to dig into those definitions. We just can't do that in, a, in an hour webinar, but we feel like their titles lend themselves to you understanding we've got to be creating lessons where those types of activities are present. So Tim, if you'll click to the next slide. In speaking with um, Ken Pransky this week, it was just reiterated. One thing that he taught um, a group of us that went and saw him last year is that the brain and heart of our students is the curriculum, okay? I want you to just think about that for a second. The brain and the heart does not change. The way that the brain learns, the way that the heart responds does not change. Our state's curriculum has probably changed three to six times since I've been in business. <laughs> and so it's not the content that needs to get into the brain that is our real curriculum, but how the brain and the heart of the child in front of us is actually functioning. So we're gonna take that love from Kim Pransky with us into the next session. Um, into this next series of slides. Dr. Zadina affirms this with her work that we are going to be referencing from her article and from her book. So we're going to end this session with an elementary example this week since we did a secondary example last week. We've got, yeah, that's right, Tim, next slide. We've got teacher A and teacher B. Um, and the, yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right, so teacher A, um, Ken Pransky, is going to help us today by, by understanding that when we're not encoding for acquisition, we're actually teaching, you know, like teachers do, and we're going to call that learned learning, okay? But when we're intentionally encoding for acquisition, Ken Pransky calls that acquired learning opportunities for students. Um, and we're going to go into detail next week. So today, just follow along with me. Learned learning versus acquired learning. Teacher A is doing a learned learning activity. 80% of kids usually get um, information that is taught in a learned learning kind of way. But what about those 20% of kids, you know, that are not learning that way? So teacher A is going to have her students write to a prompt, maybe social studies or science. Um, it's a great prompt. It's a good prompt. But all they have to do is write to the prompt. Maybe she's modeled it. Um, Teacher B is trying out her essentials. When she went back to her classroom, she's trying out those brain things. And so she's actually going to have the students write a letter to a real person or a, for a genuine purpose um, to a genuine audience. Okay, so I want you to just think about that for just a second. Already you can probably feel the essentials for encoding, for acquisition going off 
in your head for which teacher. You don't need to answer in the Padlet or answer in the chat box, but which teacher do you feel is planning intentionally to, to hit some of those essentials that we've been talking about? Just think about that. So just imagine under teacher B, if they're writing to the president of the United States, or if they're writing to a character that they love in their story. If you'll click, Tim, in Janet Zadina's article, she actually describes learned learning as the hard way. It works. Kids are going to have to study. They're going to have to want to pay attention. They're going to have to want to practice. But click again, Tim. Janet Zadina calls acquired learning the easy way. And that's why we felt the need to create these webinars to the best of our ability to show you what that would look like in, in simple lessons for virtual um, reality, you know, for today. Click again. And it should go to the next slide unless you're clicking backwards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So here's your activity for today. We're not going to um, have you poll in because we don't have much time left, but I want you to think about this teacher. The assignment is to write a letter to the author of the book that was read aloud during a Google Classroom. Okay, And for the kids who couldn't make it for the Google Classroom, they were on the phone. Um, she was on the phone with the students and she read it to them. The teacher either had them take pictures of their letters and send them to her on her phone, or she had them to um, email them to her, or they wrote their letters out and sent them back to her in self-addressed stamped envelopes that she had mailed to the homes of, of students who didn't have access. She sent the letter to the author and the author actually wrote them back and the students were able to see and hear the letter, okay? In your heads, look at the charts around that lesson. What's being hit? What essentials are being hit? And I really wanted to give you some think time. Okay, so I'm gonna ask the questions out loud one more time. And then we're going to get to a case study um, and see what really happened in the brain of a child where this took place, something similar took place. So what has the teacher intentionally planned for? If we look at the descriptors around encoding and acquisition in the academic memory chart, what does it hit? And which of the pathways is she intentionally accessing? How is this going to support the student's hierarchy of needs? How has this teacher just lowered the affective filter for a kid who hates to write? Right, and with this teacher, there was no grading of the letters. She took anecdotal notes on what kids needed, some mini lessons in spelling, some mini lessons in grammar, and um, there, was, there was no resist, resistance on the part of the students except for leaning in. And through this activity, when we talked to the teacher, some of the students actually became better readers and writers, okay? So now as we begin to, um, to end our session, we want you to see this in a real live student. This is so hard to do virtually, <laughs> but um, Tim, if you'll click. Okay, so I don't know how many of you know the story of what game shall we play, but it's a book written by Pat Hutchins. I'm not gonna go into the storyline. But this is a first grade student. It was his second year in U.S. schools. And for content teachers that are out there, I apologize if you're a secondary teacher. Um, if you're an elementary teacher, this will, this will certainly hit home. But the activities and the strategies that we're sharing today are for K-12, and they could easily um, work for novice students in the upper grades. Okay, so this is a true story about a student named Fidencio. He was up for attention and referral. Um, because his teachers loved him. They believed that he had gaps and they felt that um, it was time to, to do some, you know, interventions and uh, retention and referral were two of those ideas. One of Fidencia's teachers had learned about, let's say, our essentials and decided to encode for acquisition, okay? So she decided instead of having Fidencio write to a prompt, she would have him actually write a, a character in the story, in the story that they had read. 
And um, Fidencia was definitely motivated and aroused, as you can see by his um, his writing that that is there on the page in front of you. That was the longest string of letters he had ever written. <laughs> and he was laughing and happy the whole time that he um, scripted that out. Um, but the teacher also knew that there was probably real meaning behind those letters. And this is where I really want you to, to, to listen carefully. There was a heartfelt letter there. So she had the idea to ask him to dictate to scribe, okay? So giving, you know, going after those multiple pathways of expressing what he knew, this is what happened. All right, click, sorry, I was clicking myself. All right, so through Dictate Describe, I don't know how many of you have ever used Dictate Describe for this purpose, but it is highly effective. Click. Again. Thanks. So I'm going to read his real letter to you now. Francisco wrote, Dear Fox, tell Al to be nice to every kind of creature, and Duck, you tell Al to be responsible, and Frog, Tell to Al to be nice and all the creatures in the other book. Dear Rat, tell Al to be nice to you and Duck and you. I can't see behind my screen, but to somebody and Duck and you. Now, I have to be honest, but I knew this student and I was reading this for the first time. And it was like blowing my mind because no one knew that he had those words inside of him. All we saw were the scribbles on the page. All we saw were the, you know, were the broken words that he would say sometimes when he was called on in class, if you know what I mean. No one had given him an opportunity to really show us what was there. And what we know from Janet Zadina's article is that when we arouse a student, please write this down because it might not be on the slide, but write this down. When we provide activities that arouse and engage a student, the hidden true capacity of that child is revealed. And that was the beauty of this. And I know we're almost out of time for so for so one so for one more second. <laughs> um, click, Tim. And I wish that we could see this slide uh, um, side by side. Actually, you're gonna have to go back, Tim. Sorry. Okay, go back and then click until it shows the um the text of his dictate describe. All right, so quickly. We know that from this dictate describe, we can see that he remembered every character from the book. He even did a text to text um, connection. So he met that standard and that goal, which was really awesome. <laughs> but he's using really high academic vocabulary. He used the word creature. He used the word responsible. So what we would like for you to try to think about this week, and you can click now, Tim. Sorry, that's perfect is thinking about supporting encoding and acquisition remotely by asking your students to write letters. Um, they can write letters in their first or their second language, but it could be letters to their bus drivers um, that might bring them meals or provide hotspots in their area. It could be to cafeteria workers who are providing the meals, frontline workers, real famous authors, artists, musicians, government officials. And we want you to add your other thoughts to the bit.ly. You're not going to believe me when I say this, but this activity is more valuable than any worksheet, than any textbook, than any than writing any research paper. This is what sparks a kid. It is what um, opens them up. And, and as Ken Pransky has taught us, it's dopamine lean. Kids are leaning into their work. They're not resisting um, the work. And you can click one more time, Tim. And we did have a request for you to repeat the statement that you said what they should write down. Um, you should write down, and I hope I'm right, but that, I don't know, I can't remember. But I think it was about arousal that uh, I don't remember now because I'm so nervous. Um, uh, yes, everybody has to go back and, and watch the, the video. If someone can remember what you're supposed to write down, please put it in the Padlet. <laughs> yep. I'm so sorry. Hidden um, capacities. Hidden capacities. The true capacities. Yes, that is it. Janet Zadina teaches us from her article. The article is on our website that if we create lessons that are arousing and engaging 
That means we have to step out of our learned learning boxes and into the acquired learning boxes that children's true capacities will be revealed. And I wish I could tell you case study after case study that Fidencio, when we showed that dictate described to his teacher, she was shocked because I was working with the ESL teacher. She was shocked. It was a hidden true capacity that was revealed because we were accessing his multiple pathways and we were encoding for acquisition. I'm so excited, I wish you could see it. So what we would like for you to do is think about writing letters, uh, getting your students to write letters, and we've got options and alternatives for you as, as I close. You know that you, students can take pictures of their letter and send it to you through their parent's phone. Um, teachers, you can send paper and pre-address pre stamped envelopes for them to be able to write the letter and send it back to you or to the author directly. Um, and then also we want you to think about dictating to scribe for students who may not be reading yet or writing yet. So you can have a phone call with that student. You could do a Flipgrid, Google Meet, and we want you to add your ideas in that Grow Padlet. Um, so sorry for the, the kind of a rush toward the end, but we actually want to leave the last three minutes open for you guys. So click, Tim, to our question slide. And if you click again, and it's all yours, Tim. <clears throat> So um, just trying to man the questions uh, on the, the um, Padlet. And one, one of the things I'm seeing is I have a great question about um, somebody's asking about allowing newcomers to use their native language. Um, and should we not do that? Um, we, we should do that because it's about um, wiring, firing and wiring their brain for writing a story, for telling, uh, for writing a letter. And then we can we can we can teach the English as we go. You know, I would say like if you're in, uh, and also like for you can get real quick understanding of content. You know, because the child may have that in their native language. Where so it we I we do support it. I'm actually we do know that one of the strongest ways that we can support child bilingual children is it having them in dual language programs. We see their long term progress far exceeds what they do if they're if they're not. So developing both languages is really the, the best way to go. Real quickly, we had a request to go back to the last slide. And any other questions while we're on that slide, Ivana or Kristen? Somebody sent letters. Yay. Oh, I was talking, but I was muted. I was really glad you brought up the piece about using two languages. There were also several comments about newcomers, not just about using two languages, but about how to work with writing and other ways to help lower the effective filter. That was one of the themes. So maybe that's something we can touch on in the next session. Absolutely. And you see how teacher B, in the example that we gave today of the elementary teacher, she really worked hard on lowering that affective filter for Fidencio. And for the first time Fidencio spoke, he, has a, he had a voice and we were ab actually able to capture it. Um, it was really powerful and we all cried, actually. <laughs> So somebody mentioned voice typing in Google Docs or talk to text microphone and cell phones works the same way as dictate describe. Absolutely. And the purpose, though, for that dictate describe is to get the message out. And I didn't share that. Uh, Fidencio's letter was actually read to his whole class. And he was seen as the guy who knew how to write a letter. And before his mindset was fixed that he didn't know how to write, he didn't know how to read. So that experience actually changed his mindset to a growth mindset as well. And I think now we're getting questions about the next slide because people want to know how to get the poster for multiple pathways to learning. So it's on the website bit.ly slash want to grow seven. Um, and then we're going to be breaking up the poster and doing some descriptors around those around the pathway. Somebody posted about wanting to know more about what is meant by language and math. And it, it really is using those those 
and, and we'll, we're going to go, it's, it's hard to explain in like a quick minute. So we want to put something down that we feel really good about describing to you. And you have some time where you can take it home and digest it. Um, so the things you're taking home with you tonight, the, the music that, um, that Alicia started the meeting with that you can barely hear. Um, I'm sorry about that. That was my computer. I have no idea. It was playing. It was as playing as loud as it could. Some um, some Puto Mayo music, which is our, uh, international music. Um, the academic memory chart and definitions are there. There's a link to articles from ed educational leadership on learning in the brain, and then the poster. And then whatever else you feed us that you want us to post. And if um, you click one more click one more time, that's letting them know what next week is going to be about. So we're doing multiple pathways supporting encoding and acquisition in context. So that's also talking about in this context when kids are not with us physically. Um, and then I think we do need to quickly go on to, um, you're gonna get a survey when you finish this, please fill it out, it helps us. The feedback is great. I was really excited to see that it looks like most of you came back from last week. Um, maybe even a few <laughs> of you joined us who weren't here. So I'm really excited, um, <laughs> that made my day. Um, so I really appreciate your time. I know you're busy people and there's lots going on. Please know that we love and adore you and we think highly of what you're doing and we're hoping this is helpful in supporting you. And this is Ivana. I was just going to say, Teresa Parker is also thrilled that many of the same people came back because Teresa Parker is our amazing admin that is doing the certificates for all of these many different offerings we have. So she wanted us to let you know that instead of waiting until after the fourth session, that she's going to combine sessions one and two. So whether you can, uh, attended both or just one, she'll be putting those certificates together in the next week or two, and then she'll do a second round of certificates for uh, the third and fourth offering. We're also getting lots of questions. Um, this will be posted on our website for you to go back and see the archives and questions. That's why we're using the Padlet as well as here. The trainers will be going back and looking at those questions and using them. So don't worry if your question didn't get answered today. Yeah, I've had the Padlet open from last week all week. So we're, we're really looking through them to mm -hmm. find the things you need. So please know that it's important to us because we're used to doing things in person where people can communicate to us. And so this is how we can communicate with 250 people. Yeah, we're trying hard. You don't need to do anything to get the certificate if you entered your email correctly. So I will say today that when we realized we had to switch rooms, there were a number of people whose emails bounced. We tried to correct them, but could not correct them all. There's also the question about an invitation for next week. If you go to our website and click the registration link that is there, or if you were registered for the first session, that link is the same link for session three and four. Today was the only day that was different, and we're really glad you guys found us. Yes. As Alicia will always say, go in peace, not in pieces. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Have a good evening. Take care of yourselves.